This episode is a little bit special. It's a kind of bonus material for the Autodev Developer Conference of 2015. And in it you will hear Tim Urban and Toril Kuhnfeldt discuss artificial intelligence, life extension and differing mindsets of technology and biology. Toril Kuhnfeldt is a biologist and science journalist who is currently working on a book about de-extinction, the bringing back of extinct species. Tim Urban is the writer of Wait But Why, a fantastic website of deep dives into topics like artificial intelligence, Tesla and SpaceX, but also softer topics like procrastination and the fear of what other people think about you. We call this bonus material because you probably want some background in order to enjoy this conversation to the fullest. We highly recommend watching both their early dev keynotes. The links are in the show notes. And uh, Tim's ideas are, of course, well covered on Wait But Why as well. This conversation was recorded on stage at the conference and it's also available in video form. A link for that is in the show notes as well. Unfortunately, there was some buzzing in the audio, which I've done my best to filter out in this version. And that's why it sounds a little bit processed in many places. And special thanks go out to Stephen Chin of Night Hacking for providing all the tech and expertise we needed for making the recording possible at all. I was really happy with how this conversation came together and how it turned out, and I hope you will enjoy it too. And we're rolling! So, <laughs> welcome to the podcast, uh, Tim Urban and uh, Toril Kuhnfeldt. And uh, yeah, great keynotes uh, last night, both of you. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, it's it's my pleasure. <laughs> so the reason we're here, all three of us, is that uh, Toril and I were talking about your AI blog posts, which were also the topic of your keynote. And uh, Toril had so many inter- interesting questions because you come from more of a biology standpoint than well most of the rest of us here at the tech, at a tech conference. And I found myself thinking, I, I wish Toril could just ask these questions to Tim and see what, what kind of discussion we get from it with, without me getting in between and sort of butchering your <laughs> thought-out questions. So that's why we're here. And so I thought we'd start with the, yeah, with your the perspective on the AI. Well, yeah, because one of the things that I really want to, because you've sort of got, gone into the AI community, and, and one of the things that I really find fascinating about the biological systems, it's that they're not just about the sort of raw neural computational power. Like if you look at, say, a bee, a bee has the brain the size of a sesame seed, but biologically they can do everything that we can do. I mean, the difference between us and a bee is minuscule. It's that we're basically the same. We can do the same stuff. And I think one of the reasons why, why biology is so complex and we can do all those really weird things with our brains is that we have those you know several several systems layered on top of each other so we have the neural network but that's just the baseline because then you have a chemical network on top of that and you have a whole sort of time lag on top of that because you have neural transmitters which you know basically take a few seconds or a few minutes and maybe half an hour and then you have the whole gene regulation of let's make more neural transmitters and let's make more hormones and you know when you have growth over time you have changes over time so compared to technological systems biology systems have all of these multiple layers which actually add tremendously to the intelligence because the intelligence is just that base layer of of neurology that from a biology point of view it's it's really new and is not the most important one i mean is there anything similar to that type of chemical system within ai i haven't thought of it that way i think it's very interesting um i think it's really interesting to think about um the neural the the, the neural network and then the chemicals on top of that I, I don't think that people think about that very often um and when it comes to ai i think that people i think people both overestimate and underestimate the brain is what i i kind of come to just by talking to people and, and by thinking about what I what I knew and my own misconceptions. Um, we we underestimate the brain in that uh, we think, oh, a calculator is much faster than we are. You know, all these things are much more, you know, Google search engine, all these fancy AI, they're, they're much smarter than just our simple brain. We can barely do math at all. Um, and that's actually really not true. Like our brain is, uh, the, co- the calculations per second is out- outrageous. Um, and uh, I, I heard someone call the brain, the human brain, the most complex known object in the universe, which is pretty cool. 
It is, it is pretty cool, but you could say the same thing about a whale brain or a dog brain. So you, so you said that about the bee or about... So I, I guess, actually, um, I'm curious about that. Explain why, um, why you're saying that a bee brain is as complex as a human brain. Because if you look at it from a biological point of view, the thing that makes us human are just this tiny, tiny piece of what's actually going on. So if you look at what a bee does, and, you know, they have really complex societies, so they can do, first of all, they can do all of their bodily functions, of course. Everything right. in their body works right. from the brain. They have vision, they, they eat, they digest. They yeah, they that, right? walk, they fly, mm. they grow. All the motor skills. All the, the motor skills work, and they have, right. you know, a complex social society, which means they can recognize different individuals. They have a really advanced communication systems which means that they can uh, transfer information about you know there's a flower with this quality of nectar in that direction this distance mm -hmm. so they have a, a really advanced community they have uh, information transfer between individuals they have information transfer within the bee community which means they can regulate temperature they can make it bigger or smaller they can make revolutions kill the queen in a hot ball of fire it's That's actually really horrible <laughs> they, they sort of, do that they do that they sort of that so, is so, very interesting so the queen when she gets old i mean they're all they're all female but but so when the queen gets old, she can't produce the hormones that regulates the hive, which means there's a revolution and they all sort of gang up together and they sit on her and they buzz so that she heats up and dies. That is so annoying for her. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> After all she's done for and them. And they're that's... all their kids. I mean, it's, they're, it's their kids. Her kids. Yes. Can we just talk about bees? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Actually, and, really, and really want to go. know. <laughs> so I, I, don't get talk, I don't talk to enough biologists. Um, I've been, you know, reading so many, you know, physicists uh, and engineers, mm -hmm. um, but but this is this is great. It is. I mean, so so basically, and you can do all of this with a brain the size of a sesame seed, right? Yeah, and, and more. I mean, there's so much more. They have better vision than us in many aspects, but they're severely lacking uh, uh, in intelligence when it comes to comparing to us. In in right and well. They are severely lacking in the intelligence that we have. Right. Because right. I mean, you can say all the you know instinct. You know, elephants can sense uh, land four hundred miles away. They over over water or something like that. One of those situations when there is there's all there's all kind of animal intelligence. That's yeah. But I mean, the problem is that we are sort of lacking a good definition of intelligence. Yeah. We're lacking something that we can use to compare ourselves, octopus, elephant, bees aliens and computers we don't have a test that will work for all of these unities right basically because we don't have a definition of intelligence that goes outside the human perspective so right. we deem animals intelligent when they can do things like us when they can recognize themselves in the mirror for example that's one of the sort of key tests for animals intelligence mm -hmm. but you know you wouldn't really expect an ai to recognize itself in a mirror either right Unless you programmed it to, and then it probably pretty easily could, actually, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but, but the question is, would it recognize itself as a self? I mean, that that's when you get to a whole other question. You know, you get that. That's this entire debate about consciousness and about mm -hmm. about you know that that whole thing. But but back to what you're saying. So, um, so what you're kind of saying is that there's that there's a lot going on in biology and it's it is it's not just a a matter of a linear intelligence scale but there's a lot of things going on a lot of layers like you said and when it comes to ai the question is do we need to mimic all those layers or or is the is the important thing something that is more linear with ai and can we build something uh, build a machine that has a certain kind of intelligence that's important to us that uh, that's actually a very simple situation, and I don't know. But I think, as I said, I think we uh, underestimate brains, but I also think we also overestimate brains in that people don't don't get that actually the, the brain's a pretty weak computer as far as it goes, and it's actually very slow. Um, the 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 speed at which uh, information travels inside the brain is is is. Uh, molasses compared to what it does in a computer, so it's this weird thing where we, where we're we're trying to emulate one component of it, but we also have a, we easily can defeat 
to feed it with another component. Um, but I, I guess I would probably turn this question around on you because you understand brains a lot better than I do. So I would ask you what, what you think, um, what you think as we're, as you're creating kind of AI, you know, how, how, how should we measure intelligence and, uh, and are we, are we, are technologists, um, underestimating the challenge of human level creating human level intelligence by ignoring some of these these uh, biological systems and layers that that computers don't traditionally have yeah i i really think so i really think that ignoring basically the chemistry and the hormone input is a huge error because you're going to end up with something uh that is very i mean if we are going to continue measure intelligence basically in being like us we do the sort of human level intelligence of a of a of an AI, and even if it's going to be completely different, we're going to sort of measure its intelligence compared to us, because then we sort of want it to do some of the things that we do. We want it to be similar to us, because otherwise we wouldn't recognize it as intelligent in the same way that we don't recognize an ant as intelligent. Okay, a question I have though is: so you talk about hormones and chemicals and all of that. That's part of the, the layers we're talking about. But the, really all that is, is information, right? Ho- hormones is just, um, it, it's just information that causes some kind of, uh, some kind of synapses to fire in certain ways. And when you're building, when you're building something as a, as a computer, why would you need that? You know, you, uh, humans, human brains need blood and oxygen. You don't need to mimic that in a computer, right? And, and Perhaps so... Perhaps not. <laughs> what? Perhaps not. Well, but but the point is blood is a, is a mechanism to carry energy and other things to cells in the brain. Uh, we have instead here, we have um, transistors and you have electricity. Uh, and you, so so I, I feel like when we talk about something like hormones, wouldn't that just be part of the code? Wouldn't that be just part of the algorithms that we build? Well, I'm, I'm not a coder, so I'm not really sure how you would I'm not it. either. This but, is... but the thing is that, you know, the I would say that the sort of the chemical levels, that would be our sort of, you know, the, the core programming that you talked about yesterday, the, the things that really drives us. So if you would make a perfect copy of the brain of all of the neural firing, but you ignored the chemistry, you took away the chemistry, you would have nothing. I mean, you wouldn't have anything, you know, from the drive to get a Nobel Prize to the drive to go to the toilet, it would all be gone. It's all chemicals. That's all chemicals. So the, so the brain without those hormones and chemicals is just like a, com- a blank computer is it's, kind of what you're yeah, saying? Or? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, so no. one of the interesting things about neural networks is that you know they're constantly changing. It's not a, it's not a very stable system. Yeah. So you have this constant level of chemistry that alters it, and it alters it on on so many levels and and at such a time scale. So you have this chemicals that will alter it. You know, right now I I slept well and I had my cup of tea and I had breakfast this morning, which means my Jealous. my neurons are firing in one way. It if I hadn't done that. I would be a different human because my chemistry. Would so be right different. now, currently, I'm on an all nighter because I was working yeah. on my post. So I want to, what what is what's that doing? What what explain how that is changing me so, as a human? So what is changing is all of these minuscule changes are going on where it's going to say you know prioritize this thing instead of this thing. Prioritize uh, getting your next meal instead of you know, doing something social, right. prioritize this instead of that. You're going to have mood swings and, and then right. you're going to go, why can't my rational brain sort of override those mood swings? But it's actually the other way around. Right. The brain is serving the body in a lot of ways. The, and... the brain is serving the body. Right. Yeah. This is stuff I haven't thought of. It's very interesting to hear a biologist's perspective on something like AI because there's, a, there's and, and the, 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 the thinkers that I read, they're not thinking about this that much either i don't think no because but that's the sort of that's a sort of really human misconception yeah. you sort of go the i am brain the body is just you know stuff that happens to be around me yeah. the me the self that is the brain and therefore i can sort of get rid of all right of this we don't realize stuff. how much of us yeah our personalities is related to actually serving our body's needs like if we i think you know people always talk about you know ray kurzweil type people talk about uploading our consciousness, uploading our brains to a computer. And 
they, they, the assumption is that, that everything that, uh, that makes me, me would be there. But it's like you're saying, that's not true at all, actually. No, it's yeah, not serving I'm, a body. The brain is a totally different creature. You probably have a totally different personality if you yeah, have one at all. I, my, my perception is that that's going to be extreme. It's going to be a lot easier to transfer your brain to a dog than it's going to be to transfer your brain to a computer. A lot easier. Mm-hmm. That would be like, cool, by the way. It would be. It would be amazing. <laughs> that would, would be very, very cool. I mean, imagine if there were a human level intelligent dog yes how cool that oh what a popular dog too. <laughs> and then you would you know imagine the information that you could get access to right because if you had a communicative human level intelligence human communication intelligence right level dog i mean they dogs are pretty smart in their own way but they have access to so much information that we don't have their smell system i mean most right. we have so bad noses they're horrible oh, yeah they smell in dogs smell in layers probably uh, we have no idea because we don't have right. anything in our brains that is similar enough for us right to- so the person could be in there and then be like oh okay 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 Here's what's really happening. Start like you know typing with the nose or how yeah. the, the dog would you know, uh, and 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 uh, and explaining. Or, yeah, oh, now I want to do this. Yes, oh, God. but then you would have to sort of rebuild your brain because we don't have that neural. I mean, we have the neural system to to smell things, but it's so much bigger in a dog. Right. So you would also have a change of personality based on that input. Right. So so what does this mean? So we're saying that it's hard to produce uh, human. Like, you know, um, uh, it's hard to produce human style computers that really will act like us and, 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 and feel like us and value what we value. But the question is, if they do build something that is human level, intelligent, whatever you want to call that, it has the capacity to solve problems that kind of problems that we could solve or whatever. Um, if we can do that, then without those hormones, without those things that make us biology, you know, I always just assumed that it would be, you know, I always said it, it's like, it's like my laptop. It's not any, even if it becomes super intelligent, it doesn't have any more human to it or empathy to it or anything like that than the laptop does without being specifically programmed. Uh, so what do you think that's going to be like if we get to a computer that can be as smart as we are, but there's no, um, there's there 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 are there's none of this other biological stuff and human stuff. Well, I think first of all we're going to have a huge problem communicating with it. Oh yeah. I mean we have such problems communicating with octopus. It's not. I mean this is, <laughs> with each other. Yeah, each we, other. I mean we have problems communicating. I mean we are not very good at communicating with other intelligent beings right. on this earth. We are this. We are not good at it. We're, right. We're trying to make things that are almost as smart as us do things like, well, go through that hoop if you mean yes, and go through that hoop if you mean no. Yeah. And we can only do that for the species who are extremely willing to try to communicate. So, like a dolphin or a dog or something like that. We can't do that with an octopus because that would be the octopus would would just go. Right. Fuck, are you trying to get me to do and why would I do that and go away and stop right. disturbing me? Mm-hmm. And right. that, that does not The octopus mean... doesn't even have bones. He doesn't want to deal with you. you know, he, <laughs> right. has own, he has his own issues. <laughs> he has his own issues. You know? and, and you can't really even... They don't have a drive to communicate with humans. They communicate with each, with each other beautifully, but they wouldn't have a drive to communicate with humans. And I think you might have the same problem with an AI. Like, why should it communicate with humans unless you really program it to? Right. Why would it want to do that? And wh- how should we understand it? How should we communicate with it? Well, that's the question is, can we really program it to? That's yeah. what they're trying. Um, but there's so many different things to think about. And, and it's so easy to mess it up. And I think we cannot understand it un- unless we make it really human-like. Because we're really bad at communicating with other stuff right yeah but then again i think that we're gonna have to work on this sort of broad level intelligence test because that's what's really missing you're gonna have to develop some kind of essay to test intelligence that is not human-based right i think they'll you know they'll have a scale for computers that we'll come up with um but I think it's a bit of a misnomer to say human level intelligence because it's like you said, what does that mean? And it's and it's and it's oversimplifying the concept hugely to, to even say that. Um, 
but but you know they'll have some system to determine computer level intelligence that can equal a lot of our capacity and then at that point uh the question is whether it then starts recursively improving and, and kind of skyrockets beyond us um and one thing, I mean, one thing I, I'm really curious about when it comes to development of IE is that if you look at a brain, it is not only the software that is continually changing and continually upgrading, it is also the hardware. I mean, we get sort of new neural connections and we get rid of old ones and, you know, we strengthen some and weaken some and, and we get, you know, genetic changes. We upregulate some hormone that makes the brain go bigger or more active in one area and we downregulate a hormone that makes it go sort of blank in another area. And we, we do this sort of constant regulation and constant changing in both the software and the hardware where like constantly wet, wetware where yeah. it changes and, that. and is there anything is there anything even being thought about, you know, the constantly changing hardware that would have to go into an IE well, to adapt to Yeah. I and when we talk about that kind of thing, I think that being skeptical about whether we could do something like that to me is underestimating just how much progress is going to be made. And something like that, you know, that we'll figure that out or, or it will figure that out uh, if it's a self-improving situation. Um, I think the possibilities uh, are so limitless for what kind of computer this can be. And and I think that the ability for it to quickly code itself to, to not just change its software, but to actually move pieces in and out of the hardware to uh, physically build new transistors. I mean, I, I think that's all within reach once we talk about something that is as smart or smarter than a human. Um, so I think these are all things that are going to have to be thought about. I think I think that the, 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 almost the biggest point here is just that the average person who's pretty educated, but they don't really, really understand either computers or biology, they're going to inevitably oversimplify and underestimate this, this yes. whole situation. It is much more complicated than people realize. And the, and it's a little scary because it means that uh, programming an AI to be the way we want it to be, to serve us in the right kind of way is really, really like very, very hard. And, and it might be harder than creating one that's the problem is if that, if, if the AI safety component is a bigger challenge than AI development, um, that's when you get the development first. And once it's, once you do that, then you, you lose the ability to control it anymore. And that's why it's kind of scary about how there are billions of dollars right now being spent on AI development and AI research. And there's about $10 million uh, being spent on AI safety, like you know, 0.1%. And it's, um, and, and all of that money comes from Elon Musk, who donated $10 <laughs> million to the Future of Life Institute um, uh, to, um, uh, you know, and, and, and so it's one of those things where it's just, and it's not like that's going to change. There's not going to be a huge upswing in funding for AI safety, because it's not uh, a profitable venture and so it's just you know everyone's gonna say yeah that's really important someone else should kick in the money i'm gonna go do my thing now you know and and so that's not going to change um and the, and so the question is the people who are developing it are they thinking about this are they are they worrying about it uh because i don't know i don't know if regulations can stop it either regulations don't have a good history of being able to slow technology um, no not at all no. it's it's i mean it's, it is quite likely to happen but i think it's going to end up being something very different from basically anything we can imagine right because unless we make it like biology it's going to be so completely different right. compared to us and there's just no way of knowing but it's going to have a lot of power it's going to have so much power over us if it wants to Yes, but would it want to? Because it won't have chemicals, and every single well, want. When I say is want, though, I just mean you know. Right now, like if I um, if I press call on my phone, it wants to make that call for me because that's hmm. the programming. So it's you know the word want uh, in the way we use it is not doesn't apply, but it will have its own programming. You know, uh, the the every every machine that we build wants to do its task because that's what so. It's just a question of, you know, it, it, that can be bad for us if it decides that we're in the way of its objective 
It can also be bad if it decides that we're irrelevant to its objective and it's causing a lot of chaos, just the same way that when we, when humans came to, uh, you know, humans arrive in different places, we end up extincting all kinds of animals. And that's not, you know, it's not because we hate the animals usually. It's because we're, we're, we're brash and we do stuff that messes up. So if it starts, you know, if the AI starts mining our earth for all kinds of properties, uh, for all kinds of chemicals and, and, uh, and elements, uh, yeah, that could, that could be, that could be bad for us. That, that could be, that could be, <laughs> that could be very bad, yes. Right. And so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I always come back to it, this kind of thing. Like, I'm really happy it's not my problem yeah. to figure this out. And I can just kind of go back and like forget about this in 10 minutes and like live my life because otherwise I would be very stressed about this all the time. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really, this is, you know, such as a, uh, the inventor, but I'm really hoping that, you know, if we actually make a really good AI, maybe that could communicate with the octopus oh, yes, for us. Yes. I would love, <laughs> right. I mean, I'm really annoyed by it this could, lack of communication I bet with the octopi. Could, it could alter an octopus's DNA so that it becomes super, an intelligent octopus and then it can talk yeah. to us. It can do, if something is that smart, it can, it can going in and affecting DNA, which is just software, yeah. it'll be able to go and just quick, you know. It'll, but I'm more like, the, the octopus is already really intelligent. It right. just doesn't, it's not just communicating with us. I want the AI to be the sort of communication tool between right. us and What the do we octopus? find out when it does that? That the octopus has like a great sense of humor and it's yeah. like a very cool dude, actually. I wouldn't be surprised. They seem to be amazing <laughs> yeah, creatures. They, they are amazing. Yeah, the creatures. whole time. The, and, and if you finally communicate and, and, and then the AI tells us like, oh yeah, this whole time the octopus has just been like very, you know, just very unimpressed with you guys. Oh yeah, sure. You know, I don't know. But it's uh, very, yeah, it's very exciting. More of me is excited than scared because, I'm, you know, as I kind of said, What's my personal, my personal fate is personal extinction, uh, regardless of what happens to the species. So just selfishly, that's pretty bad. Uh, and there's a lot of suffering in the world. I mean, the world has all kinds of problems. That's pretty bad. So to me, there's, if, if there's so much room to go, to get better, um, that, uh, I'll kind of take my chances, I think. And I think I'm rooting for this to move forward, uh. even though, you know, if you take a big step back, that might be kind of stupid. Yeah, no, I'm... What do you I, want? No, I, I'm the same. I'm I'm more into the whole sort of genetic engineering. What can we do with biology? How can we meld the biology? But it, it ties together. And, you know, we're going to have robots doing the genetic engineering for us really, really soon. I mean, completely automated right. genetic engineering for us. And then it's going to go, why do you want to change only 10 genes? I can t- change 10,000 genes for you. That's... Right. Well, so I actually... Uh, because you're a biologist, I had a question. Um, I was. Um, You're running out of time, by the way. If you want well, to catch your plane, you, you have a, a minute or two more. We can we can go a little. I mean, this is. I, I need to get all the info I can while I have a biologist yeah, here. <laughs> um, so, um, my question is, I always, you know, think about, and I haven't done research on this myself yet. But I think about reverse aging and stuff like that, and 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 and, uh, and how the human body is just a physical device in the end it's just a machine it's just matter it's just cells and atoms and it's all stuff that if you just knew how to manipulate it at the smallest level you could change it and uh and th- and so actually i i used to think okay so why can't we just you know all the only when, the only thing that makes people age is when cells age and and you have that thing where the thing gets shortened and then right okay. the telomeres yeah. yes um so I can okay, we'll just send little nanobots in to fix that. And then I started to realize there's a few problems with that. One, nanobots have a surface area to volume ratio where they, they can't really do stuff on that size at that level on their own. Two, it's not like you're 90 and uh, there are some people that are 90 and they can't see well, but they can run really fast. Like 90-year-olds are bad at everything because the whole system's shutting down. And so... The only way it seems to me that you can do something like this is, is the DNA level to recode the software. Yeah. And then you have the problem of, you know what kind of cells have really long telomeres? Cancer cells. Cancer cells. So, we, you know, you have this, and the, the, the problem here, I think we're going to solve, maybe not solve, solve, but we're going to improve aging tremendously in lots of different ways and lots of different scales. But the problem is that we have to, it's an optimization sort of problem. So the problem is... Every time a cell divides, you're going to have a copy of the DNA. Making that copy perfect 
takes a lot of energy. So we have this whole system of good enough. Like, we don't want to make it perfect, because that would take so much energy that we would have to eat, and we wouldn't be able to reproduce, because, right. you know, we could have spare no energy for anything else than you're making these perfect, perfect, perfect copies. But we can't do that, because, so we have this sort of good enough system, and, and it seems like basically everything is our, in our body, and this makes sense from a biological point of view, it's just the sort of good enough level. Good enough to get by, good enough to have kids, good enough to have grandchildren right. and help raise them, and then, you know, that's enough. And and that is on every single level, from DNA construction all the way up to sort of organs and how they function and, and how they fail. So going in and sort of tweaking that good enough level is going to be very interesting. <laughs> and you have, there's a few species that obviously have tweaked them in another way than we have. So say elephants, for example. So basically, the more times a cell divides, the bigger chance of can cancer, and that equates to size and lifespan. Now, elephants are big, and they are long-lived, and they very rarely get cancer. Huh. So obviously, they found a way to do this optimization slightly different, so that they can do more cell divisions without getting cancer, although it'll take away from something else, probably partly due to the fact that elephants have very, very low reproduction rate. So, Is it possible that we've actually evolved toward cancer because it's uh, increasing the human lifespan wasn't evolutionarily helpful to pass genes on, and actually it may have been a bad thing maybe because, sort of better if you die yeah otherwise you have the 120 year old eating the food of the tribe the tribe's food we don't need him around anymore he's not well this this a very clear difference in strategy with, between animals and plants right so a plant you know a few plants they sort of age but they don't age in the same way as we do they don't have the same sort of fixed lifespan. They also don't have a fixed size and shape. Like, every tree is not exactly the same. They don't have the same number of branches or right. whatever. And they're also very good at cloning themselves. Right. So most, or a lot of plants can clone themselves. They don't have to sexually reproduce unless they really want to. So it seems to be that lives has, have taken two extremely different routes when it comes to sort of aging and the the body, basically, and how do you sort of be in a physical place. So trees, I mean, the oldest individuals in the world are trees. And, and that actually is on two levels. So one is the level of, you know, a, a single tree living for a very long time that we can sort of grasp. But the other level is sending out multiple clones, which are still sort of somewhat connected and... Cool. And, you know, making new individuals of yourself continuously. And and not sexually reproducing, but sending up new shoots of, of yourself right. over and over and over again. And that is a completely different take on aging compared to what almost every animal does. Right, so it's, it's like aging is beneficial in an animal species in a way. It might be, or it might be a byproduct of something else we do. Right. So, because it's not outliers is the thing. What would be if there were some two hundred year olds out there, or one person that's lived to one fifty? You'd say, okay, you know, there's a, the fact that there's none. I mean, zero out of a seven billion zero have lived past one twenty one or whatever it is. That is, um, that says that there's there we are not just, you know, it, it, we don't have a propensity to die at a certain age. We are absolutely coded to absolutely positively die by that age, yeah. which makes me think that in order to, you know, kind of reverse aging, it's, it's not about fixing cells because you're fighting against your basically your body's desire to die in a lot of ways. It's about co recoding the DNA somehow, right? Well, it, it might be. I think you really have a point, but I'm not sure because you can look at things like heartbeats. So basically every mammal get the same number of heartbeats. You can plop them. Yeah, that's really interesting. It is really interesting. So a mouse, which has a heart that just goes this, short is going to have a really short lifespan, whereas an elephant can go like, do-dunk, do-dunk, is going to have such a longer lifespan. So, it, you know, apparently a heart can only 
do this thing for this amount of beats. And it's not clear if that is a bug or a feature. It's right. so unclear. Because uh-huh. it's and all of these things, as you say, they seem to failure at more or less the same time. And Yeah. And it's not clear whether it's a bug or a feature. Because it might just be that, you know, why spend energy after this certain point? Why why bother from yeah, a Yeah, evolution from a, doesn't care about individuals. <laughs> evolution evolution cares about getting genes to keep moving. That's what ends up being successful. Yeah. <laughs> the things that happen to do that really well. And that's the only thing, but And you can do that in so many different ways. So there I mean there's several species. I mean this one sort of bowl uh, that that just goes they go on it they grow up to a certain range and, and the males just go on a sort of rampant sex rage and they, they survive for like a few months after that but they lose all of their I mean they basically sort of wear themselves to death on a sort of rampant sex rage and then they, they just collapse and die. Right. The and that's it. a successful evolution. That's a successful <laughs> evolution. In the same way that, you know, a tree sort of con- continuously shooting up genetic copies of itself and occasionally having sex, but most of the time just doing copies of itself, yeah. is also a successful evolutionary strategy. Okay, so taking this into account, everything you just said, and all the stuff about AI and the potential for it to come around and to, to give us new technology, what is your prediction for of every human that's currently alive, whichever of those humans ends up living the longest, how long does that human end up living? There? Uh, so, it's. I think that I think it'll be possible to add a hundred years. It's going to be difficult, and it's going to take. We might do it. Do you think a, someone alive now might live to two hundred? I think someone who is really rich and who is prepared to go through a lot of pain and make a lot of difficult decisions will live to 200. Well, that's yes. not that fun, the way you just said it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I want it to be like the person's just like, you know, like a really cool 200-year-old that's uh. hanging out. Okay, and, 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 and my last question, because I, I I'm going to miss my plane, huh? is um, what are your thoughts on cryonics? Cryonics. Freezing yourself, Ooh, that is... so that um, so that the people in the year twenty five hundred who have far more technology than we do can might be able to very easily say, of course, we can like bring this person back with an artificial body. And well, I think apparently we can freeze cells. They are doing fine. We can freeze them and thaw them and freeze them and thaw them, and they're doing fine. Right. So individual cells, sure, that works. Um, I think the technology that we have right now. It's just medieval. Um, I think we're going to fuck up quite a lot of things within the body without intention because not all of it is live cells. Um, But yes, I think that might actually be one of the roots in the future of preserving information. I may, I may, very different. But I'm hoping that they become less medieval, like Mm. in a few decades when I'm ready to, to freeze myself, so that's what I'm thinking. Hopefully, yeah. All right. Because obviously we freeze cells and they function beautifully. Right, you have embryos and... Yeah, yeah, and we, you know, and we can freeze them for ages. I think, yeah, it, it's more about the, how long the freezer has been there than how long the cells has been there. It seems to work really well. That's very good to know. It's good. <laughs> promising. Yeah, so we're kind of out of time. All right, well, this was awesome. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for a fantastic discussion. Yeah, you know stuff. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Me too. It's great. I, I know some stuff. You, like, know lots of stuff. Uh. It's great. So, thank you. Yeah, thank, cool. thank you so much. Tim All right. Tutorial. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Let me put it this way, Mr. Amer. The 9000 series is the most reliable computer ever made. No 9000 computer has ever made a mistake or distorted information. We are all, by any practical definition of the words, foolproof and incapable of error.